now it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, James Earl Carter, Jr. from Plains, Georgia. Better known around the world as Jimmy Carter, the 39th President of the United States of America. I first met President and Mrs. Carter last year when we both attended a private worship service with President and Mrs. Trump at St. John's Episcopal Church on the morning of President Donald Trump's inauguration. I was asked to read a portion of scripture from Matthew 6 where Jesus taught how we should pray in our closets and not in the streets as the hypocrites do to be seen of men. That, that this passage also includes the Lord's Prayer as a model prayer. Even though it's one of my favorite passages, I have to admit I was a bit nervous. But the night before the event, my daughter Caroline prepped me with this word of advice. Dad, stay on script. Don't try to be funny. <laughs> I admit I did ad-lib a little bit anyhow, and I got chastised for it both by the President's people and by Caroline. But President Carter must have liked what I said because during the service, he stopped me on the way back to my seat and said he thought I had done an excellent job. So, sorry, Caroline. <laughs> that means a lot, that means really a lot coming from a man who has often been called the world's most famous Sunday school teacher. As you may know, Mr. Carter has taught a Bible class for most of his adult life. In fact, he's scheduled to teach one tomorrow in Plains, Georgia. I was so impressed with the President's kind demeanor, humility, and warmth to me on that cold day in January. It was one of the highest honors of my life to welcome President Carter to our commencement. Becky and I attended the opening of the Billy Graham Library in, 19, in 2007, about one month after my father's death. And I remember commenting to Becky then that of the four former presidents speaking that day, Jimmy Carter sounded more like one of us than the rest. Mr. Carter is the third president to honor liberty by speaking at, at commencement here uh, following George H.W. Bush in 1990 and Donald Trump in 2017. President Trump has called me and spoken to me about, how, about his appreciation for the former president's friendship and support. It struck me on that inaugural morning in, in D.C. that President and Mrs. Carter were the only former president and first lady to attend the service. Both Presidents Carter and Trump entered the White House as outsiders to the Washington establishment. And I hope that many more outsiders will follow. And the longer I live, the more I want to know about a person and give my political support to a person. Policies are important, but candidates lie about their policies all the time in order to get elected. The same elite establishment that Jesus condemned remains the real enemy today. President Carter was born October 1, 1924, in the small farming town of Plains, Georgia. His father, James Earl Carter Sr., was a farmer and businessman. His mother, Lillian Gordy Carter, was a registered nurse. In 1946, he earned his Bachelor of Science degree from the United States Naval Academy in, in Annapolis. And we'll be playing them in football soon, so I hope you root for us. He served in the uh, he served in the Navy in both the Atlantic and Pacific fleets and was personally chosen by Admiral Hyman Rickovers, one of the greatest naval officers in U.S. history, to join the nuclear submarine program. Upon graduation from the Naval Academy, he married Eleanor Rosalind Smith. This coming July, they will celebrate their 72nd year of marriage. They They have three sons, one daughter, eight grandsons, three granddaughters, and two great-grandsons. When President Carter's father died in 1953, he resigned his naval commission and moved back home to Plains, Georgia, where he took over the farm and the peanut warehouse business. He quickly became a leader in his community, serving on supervisory boards for education, the hospital, and the library. In 1962, he won, he won election to the Georgia Senate, and in 1970, became the governor of Georgia. Georgia governors are limited to one term, so by the end of his governorship, Carter had already announced his candidacy for the presidency. He served as president from 1977 to 1981, during, during some of the most challenging 
days of our nation's history. Since the 1973 Roe versus, Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision legalizing abortion, three men have been elected president from the Democratic Party. And as a matter of historical record, it was President Jimmy Carter who signed into law the Hyde Act, which barred federal funds from being used to pay for abortions. This was considered the first legislative pushback against the court's decision, and Carter's support of the Hyde Act cost him politically among his own party. Senator Ted Kennedy's people wrote into the 1980 Democratic National Platform that the party was in favor of full funding for abortion on demand. But the incumbent president from their own party, the man sitting on the platform with me, wrote the committee a letter of opposition to their position on federal funding of abortion. President Carter's life can be described as having the courage of conviction. I pray that more men and women aspire to serve in public office with such courage. Upon leaving the White House in 1980, he said there is still much to be done, and he, he meant it. Mr. Carter is the author of 29 books, almost all of which were written since his presidency. In 1982, he founded the Carter Center, which has almost completely eradicated the guinea worm, a painful and debilitating waterborne parasite that affected an estimated 3.5 million people worldwide. Jimmy and Rosalind Carter volunteer one week, one week a year for Habitat for Humanity, a nonprofit organization that helps needy people in the United States and other countries renovate, renovate and build homes for themselves. Likewise, students at Liberty University just finished constructing a Habitat, habitat house here in Lynchburg. Christians all acknowledge that Jesus taught we should feed the, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, help the poor, widows, orphans, and the least of these. At the same time, many good Christians disagree about what the role of government should be in helping the poor. Jesus never said whether it was Caesar's job to help those in need or not, but he made it clear that it is our job. When I was a student at the University of Virginia School, School of Law, all the students knew of my father's conservative politics, and not many agreed with him on many issues, but they were, they were kind to me. I made a lot of good friends. For example, they would often tell me that while they disagreed with my father on the abortion issue, they admired him for not, not just railing against abortion, but for also offering a free alternative to unwed mothers to the Liberty Godparent home. That same, the same thing can be said about Jimmy Carter as president, he did support government programs for the, for, the, for the poor, but he also spent the last few decades swinging a hammer himself, building housing and supporting the poor through his foundation. I'm proud that Christians are uniting here today on issues where they agree, rather than fighting over issues where they disagree. I remember as a high school student in the 1970s when many conservative Christians criticized Jimmy Carter for giving an interview to Playboy magazine and say, saying in that interview that he had sinned because he had lusted in his heart. He told me, la told me last night that he took a 15-point hit in the polls after saying that. Then it hit me this week that Jesus said in Matthew 5 that the old law said, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you that who whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. And I realized that Jimmy Carter, in making that statement to the magazine, was making, so many decades ago, he was just making the same point that Jesus made in Matthew 5, that we are all sinners in our hearts, even if not by overt action. It saddens me today to, to, think, saddens me today to think that so many conservative Christians attacked and demeaned Jimmy Carter in the 1970s for quoting Jesus Christ to a secular magazine. Finally, in 2002, President Carter was recognized for his lifetime of work towards peace, especially for his efforts undertaken during his post-presidential years, and he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Now I ask that the Provost and President Carter join me at the podium. In recognition of President Carter's contribution to our nation and in acknowledgement of his peacemaking leadership across the globe, as well as Christian humanitarian activities among the least of these in all lands, 
and in recognition of his running the race with endurance into his ninth decade with the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Liberty University. The Doctorate of Humanities is hereby conferred upon former President James Earl Carter, Jr. with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereunto. And now to deliver our 45th, he said, he just said, can I say a few words now? <laughs> <laughs> and now to deliver our 45th commencement address, please join me in welcoming the Honorable James Earl Carter, Jr. Thank you very much, Jerry. I enjoyed that very much. I want to say anybody who doesn't believe in prayer, just look at the rain coming down. If it hadn't been for prayer, I think we would have been had rain this morning. So thank you for that. To Dr. Hawkins, who is uh, retiring now as a provost of this great university, and to Secretary Carson, who's here, whom I've admired for a long time, the president of uh, Falwell and all of his family, to the students who are graduating, to the parents who've uh, supported them, and to all the rest of you. This is a wonderful crowd. Jerry told me before we came here that it's even bigger, I hate to say this, than it was last year. I don't, I don't know if President Trump will admit that or not, but uh, to me it's pretty a lot. Well, I'm truly grateful for the invitation to speak to this uh, wonderful graduate every class of the remarkable Christian University. I understand that there are 110,000 students enrolled, and I understand also that this year 20,000 or more are graduating, that uh, 30,000 students who are enrolled here are in the military, and that 27% of all those online of minority students, African Americans and others. This is the only way they can get an education. I want to thank Liberty University for offering that chance to all of them. Also, I've noticed that among the graduates, the youngest one is only 16 years old, and the oldest one is almost 90 years old. It's a female, and she doesn't want to know which one she is, because she doesn't want to know her, you know, know her age. But she's only she's uh, four years younger than I am. Well, the students also contribute each year more than a, almost a million hours of service to other people. I have to admit that I was somewhat surprised to be invited to come to Liberty to speak, and I want to thank President Falwell for making it possible for me to do so. I remember receiving a whole lot of letters from Liberty University when students and faculty when I was in the White House. Uh, most of them were about my giving away our Panama Canal or forming what they considered to be an unnecessary Department of Education or normalizing diplomatic relations with the communist government of China. But those critical letters pretty well ended when the 1980 election results brought my involuntary retirement from the White House. And after that, I didn't get very, very many letters from Liberty. And I particularly appreciate the chance to come here today. President Falwell wanted me to say a few words about my background, and I already prepared some remarks that might duplicate some of the things he just said and correct a few minor mistakes that he made. <laughs> I grew up on a peanut farm near Plains, Georgia, in a community called Archery that had about 50 families, almost all of whom were African-American, and so were my playmates. 
I, in fact, it was during segregation times, but the only distinction among us, the only rank among us, was whoever had uh, caught the biggest fish recently or could run fastest or could pick the most cotton in one day. I left home when I was 17 years old, and the World War II was just beginning. This was in 1941. I was, uh, went to Georgia Tech, where I joined the Navy and the Naval ROTC, and then I went on to the Naval Academy at Annapolis, and that's where I began to teach Bible lessons on Sunday. As a matter of fact, I taught the children of the families who were stationed there permanently. I later served as a submarine officer, and in my last duty in the, at the sea in the Pacific Ocean was during the Korean War. I served in the Navy for 11 years, then I came back to Plains, Georgia, and to a life of uh, farming. One of the most memorable occasions I had then was to volunteer as what the Southern Baptist Convention called a pioneer missionary program. Every year I would go somewhere assigned by the Southern Baptist Convention to bring other people to Christ. One of my most memorable was to go to Massachusetts. And I had a leader there who was from Brooklyn, New York. He was a Cuban American and his name was Eloy Cruz. I would read a few verses from the Bible in Spanish using a different vocabulary than the one I had used in the Navy, I might say. And then Eloy Cruz would uh, give the plan of salvation to prospective followers of Christ. And he was remarkably successful in winning those souls to be Christians. When we got through with our assignment in Massachusetts and began to, and got ready to leave to go back home, I asked Eloy Cruz, what is the secret to your success in winning souls to Christ? And he was a little embarrassed by my question. But then he finally said, I try to have two loves in my heart. One love is for God. And the other love I have in my heart, I try, is for the person who happens to be in front of me at any particular time. That's a very profound statement and one that I've remembered ever since that time. Since leaving the White House, I've been a professor at Emory University. I just finished my 36th year as a professor, and uh, I still teach Sunday school at Maranatha Baptist Church in Plains, Georgia. Plains is a town of 700 people. It's grown a lot since I was a child. And uh, we have 11 churches in town. So Maranatha is a very small church. We only have about 25 regular members, but um, when I teach the Bible classes every, every Sunday, uh, we have several hundred visitors. Last Sunday, we had 700 visitors. We had to turn away 200 who couldn't get them in the church or in our classrooms. I have made a living writing, Jerry said 29 books. I, actually, I've written 32 books. And uh, I gave him a copy of one of them last night so he could remember how many books I've written. <laughs> and Rose and I are not yet quite married as long as he said. If we stay together for two more months, we'll celebrate our 72nd anniversary as a, as a married couple. <laughs> Rose and I found it. <coughs> And we still work at the Carter Center. And we try to do two things. One is to promote peace, and the other one is to be a champion of human rights. This is a major operation, and we've had programs in 80 countries in the world trying to bring peace and democracy and freedom and a better life to people who live there. It's a, it's a big job. For instance, in Ethiopia, we trained almost 37,000 nurses. It took us 10 years to do it. And now when we go to Ethiopia to treat diseases like trachoma and others, we can treat as many as 10 million people 
in five days with the help of those 37,000 nurses. This is more people than, uh, than live in the state of Virginia or the state of Georgia. We also try to eradicate some of these diseases, do away with them completely all over the world. In fact, at the Carter Center, we have the only organization on earth that analyzes every year, or rather constantly, every human illness to see which ones might be completely eliminated from one country or one region or eradicated from the entire earth. Uh, one of our programs is against guinea worm. Guinea worm is, uh, goes to a length of about almost a foot, almost a yard long, almost 36 inches long in human body after the human drinks filthy water from a stagnant pond. And then about a year later, that worm emerges from the body through an excruciatingly painful sore. And farmers can't go to the field and children can't go to school. To start with, we found three and a half million cases of guinea worm in the world in 21 different countries. As of the beginning of this month, which is the last report I've had, we only have th three cases in the whole world now in one country of Chad. As Jerry mentioned, for 35 years, Rose and I have volunteered to lead a habitat organization with a work project somewhere. One year, we're overseas, and the next year, we go to the United States. This year, we're going to be near South Bend, Indiana. Last year, we were in Canada. Our biggest project was in the Philippines a number of years ago. We had 14,000 other volunteers join me in Roseland, and in five days, we started and completed 293 homes uh, for people who were desperately poor. The, the woman who lived in, would live in our house had three daughters, and before she got her new home, she and her daughters spent every night in an abandoned septic tank. They pulled a canvas cover over the top of it to keep the rain out. I understand that the resident students here at Liberty are building habitat houses here in Lynchburg, and I hope you'll keep up your, pro your work because even all of those graduates will keep up their work, and the parents as well, and the pro professors as well, because Habitat really needs you every day. As a younger person, I lived during two serious crises, much worse than anything we face today. One was the Great Depression when I was a child growing up on a farm, and the second one was the Second World War. And when I faced difficult times, I remember the advice that my favorite school teacher used to give us, Miss Julia Coleman. She would tell us students, we must accommodate changing times, but cling to principles that never change. And I try to do that whenever I get in trouble. All of us Americans now have other crises to face. And let me mention just a few. I remember back in 1999, toward the end of that year, I was asked to make two major speeches. One was in Taiwan, and the other one was in Oslo, Norway. And the subject I was assigned to, to talk about was what is the greatest challenge that the world faces or will face during the new millennium. And I pointed out that it was uh, the great disparity in wealth between the richest people and those who still work for a living with their families. Since then, this disparity in wealth has gotten much greater, both within nations and also, in, also between nations. Right now, for instance, eight people, eight people, six of them Americans, have control more wealth than the other three and a half billion people, half of the world's total population. 
I've, recently, I've changed my mind about the biggest challenge that the world faces. I think now it's a human rights problem, and it is the discrimination against women and girls in the world. Let me give you a couple of examples. There are about 160 million girls and women who are not living today because their parents, in order to comply with laws or customs and to have just male sons, either kill their daughters by strangling them at birth or they have the modern day ability to decide before the baby is born what it's going to be. And if the fetus is female, then they abort the child. Atlanta, where the Carter Center is located, is the greatest center for human trafficking or slavery in America. One reason is that we have the most busiest airport in the world for passengers. And a lot of our passengers come from the Southern Hemisphere. And a girl who is brown skin or black skin can be sold, according to the New York Times, to a brothel owner for about $1,000. And the brothel owner makes about $35,000 for these forced brothel prostitutes. Also, the last time we did a check in our military, it was found that there are 16,000 cases of sexual abuse every year in the U.S. military, probably one of the finest organizations on earth. The portion of people in prison has also skyrocketed in recent days. There's more than seven times as many Americans in prison as they were when I left the White House. Seven times as many, more than any other country on earth. And now we also know that the partisan divisions and the racial division in our country have never, are becoming deeper and deeper. In fact, all our religions are also divided, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Islamic, I'm sure Hinduism and Buddhism. On two occasions, you might be interested in knowing, in 1981, I brought about 40 of the top Southern Baptists together at the Carter Center in Atlanta. I was just out of the White House, and when I asked them to come, they came. Seven of those, mostly men who came, would become presidents of a Southern Baptist Convention. And we tried, but failed, to resolve the differences between us and keep all the Baptists together. One of the differences we couldn't solve was the status or equal status of women. I'm glad to say that our common faith in worshiping Jesus Christ, though, is slowly bringing us back together. And Jerry and I talked last night about the possibility that he and I and all of you, I hope, will work as much as we can to unify Christians in the world, and particularly Baptists ought to come together as friends and not be alienated one from another. More recently, the threat of nuclear war has become more acute. America has abandoned its leadership, as you know, as a champion of a clean and healthy environment. Broad confidence in our public officials has gone down, and we citizens have tended to lose faith in ourselves and in each other. We've also lost our support and our commitment to those principles that never change. But I'm very glad to say that most of you have chosen the unchangeable premises or principles of Christianity. Only one time in human history have people tried to adopt these really high principles that never change, that are worthy of, ad of adopting. And that was after the death of more than 60 million people 
in the Second World War. <clears throat> and also, after the Holocaust, it was perpetrated, orchestrated by Adolf Hitler. I monitored those proceedings from the deck of uh, my first ship to which I was assigned after I finished Annapolis. And when the United Nations was established, to make sure that there was never any more armed conflict between people and that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted to assure that, that everybody would be treated equally and would have justice. We know that the United Nations has failed to bring peace and universal human rights have not been realized. However, we also know that the modern ability to travel rapidly and instant communications, along with the wide use of social media, have brought an enormous step to a, tru a truly global society for the first time. We evangelical Christians, and I consider myself to be one of them, one of you, must use this world coming together and communicating instantly with each other to promote the word of gospel about Jesus Christ. Theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, one of my favorites, used these words, and he said, the sad, deuce, the sad duty of politics is to establish justice in a sinful world. This in itself would be a great achievement, but we Christians know there's one step much greater than just bringing justice to a society, and that is to promote the use of agape love, self-sacrificial love among people. When I became president, and before I was inaugurated, when I, when I was elected, I was given a brief by the military leaders of our country. And I learned, really for the first time, that if I perm permitted a nuclear war, the use of atomic weapons, that the arsenals of the Soviet Union and the United States alone, if they were used in that kind of war, might, would end the ability of all human beings and animals to survive because of the direct explosions, the uh, atomic fallout, and the covering of the skies by dark clouds of smoke and debris from the, from the nuclear devices. No human being and no animals could survive a nuclear war. We now still have that great responsibility and threat, and we have to share it with seven or eight other countries, which you know, Russia, China, Great Britain, France, England, Israel, Pakistan, and India and maybe we don't know for sure North Korea. With this threat to human existence, what then can you and I do about it? For a long time, humans had to contend with animals, and we depended on our, just for survival, and we, de and we depended on our speed, our agility, our strength, to survive in competition with animals. We know that for several generations now, human intelligence and the weapons that we have developed will permit us to prevail over other animals. So what is that left to do? How can we prevail, how can we as, as human beings? One of the things we have to learn is how to get along to do good for one another and to get along with our potential enemies 
instead of how we can prevail in combat. In other words, just follow the mandates of the Prince of Peace. Just learning how to live even with our enemies in peace is what Jesus taught. And that will be our only sense for survival in the future. We don't need enemies to fight. No, we, nor do we need inferior people who we, whom we can dominate. Let me just quote one verse of scripture in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither male or female. There is neither slave nor master. For you are all one, all one in Jesus Christ. So far, we Americans, down through history, have had a hard time adjusting to this concept of equality. We fought the Civil War, the war between the states, that finally ended slavery. In the 1920s and then 40 years later, we had a struggle in our country of granting white women and then 40 years later, black women as well, of just the right to vote. And more recently, we have been struggling to end racial segregation. Even now, some of us are still struggling to accept the fact that all people are equal in the eyes of God. As when I was president As when I was in the Navy and also when I was president, I want the United States to be strong enough so we never have to prove that we are strong. But there are attributes of a superpower that go beyond military strength. It's the same as those of a person. Our nation should be known as a champion of peace our nation should be known as a champion of equality. Our nation should be known as a champion of human rights. We should also be admired for our generosity to other people in need and other moral values. In other words, for those principles that never change. There's no reason why the United States of America can't epitomize these high virtues. Despite all these challenges that I've already outlined, maybe to your discouragement, as a Christian, I believe that the ultimate fate of human beings will be good with God's love prevailing. As new graduates, you're probably now blessed with a maximum freedom that you will ever know. In the past, your parents and others have had a major influence over your lives. And in the future, years ahead, you'll also have a major influence from the job that you accept or the career that you choose. And also, I would say, from the husband or wife that you might choose. So right now, in fact, you have a maximum opportunity use three gifts that God gives every one of us. Life, freedom, and in effect, a guarantee that every single one of us will have enough talent and enough opportunity to live a successful or completely successful life as judged by God. We may not be rich, we may not live to be an old person. We may not have many loyal friends. But neither did Jesus have any of those things. But he lived a perfect life. Without any interference from anybody else. All by ourselves. We have complete freedom to make a judgment. This is the kind of person, every one of us decides, this is the kind of person I choose to be. 
we decide whether we tell the truth or benefit from telling lies. We're the ones that decide, do I hate or am I filled with love? We're the ones who decide, do I think only about myself or do I care for others? We ourselves make these decisions and no one else. There are no limits to our ambition as a human being. And we have available to us, every one of us, constant contact with God in heaven, the creator of a universe and the creator of each one of us. How many of us decide ahead of time when we're gonna be born or where we'll be born? or who our parents will be, or what our native intelligence level will be. You see, through prayer, we can have constant contact day or night with our Creator who knows everything and can do anything. We have a perfect example to follow if we're in doubt. We just have to remember the perfect life of Jesus Christ. Thank you very much, and congratulations to all of you.